All right, uh, hi, uh, I'm Oleg. I write JavaScript. Also, I uh, write CSS. And um, sometimes I write CSS in JavaScript. Uh, and uh, I also maintain a library uh, I created in 2014, um, which is called JSS. And to answer all the questions that I had on the GitHub, is the library dead? And no, it's not dead. <laughs> we are working on it. Actually, it uh, grows uh, in the usage quite heavily, and we are uh, hitting right now about 300,000 downloads per month. And uh, we are uh, working on a version 10. So hopefully uh, next week we are able to release it. Um, who knows this company? Heads up who knows this company? Yeah, a few. So uh, I work for Webflow. Um, Webflow is um, a tool that works in a browser that allows you uh, to design your web application and generate production-ready code. So uh, if you're a designer or a business owner, try this, because I, th I think it's uh, something unique on the market. Uh, also, I use Twitter. Um, uh, so I have, basically, I have uh, two, two Twitter accounts. One is uh, this one, uh, if you want to say something good, but uh, in the case you want to say something bad, I have another one for you. Um, I was not supposed to talk about JSS today, but uh, apparently JSS has many, many different meanings, and one of them is just survive somehow, so <laughs> I'm going to talk about JSS, <laughs> uh, but not about JSS, uh, that is the JSS and JS library, but about something else. Um, and so the problem that I see in, in software engineering in general is that it's somehow detached from the physical world that we live in. For instance, um, if, you, if you would sit under an apple tree and an apple falls down on your head, uh, in the physical world you are going to discover three, three new laws, uh, basically uh, Isaac Newton did. But in the software world, uh, you probably wouldn't. So you, you, can, you can do whatever you want and probably not die, at least not soon enough. Um, and so, if a customer asks you, can you please uh, turn around the gravity and make the apple fall not down but up? As a software, okay, yeah, we are smart. Of course we can do it. So let me just quickly change the direction of the gravity and we are done, right? And, you know, this, uh, this has consequences, but uh, to recognize these consequences, you need to wait for half a year or a year working on the same product. And, and so I figured software engineering has two main limitations. It's uh, hardware, which is obvious, or networking. And uh, the second one, which is most annoying, is humans. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, software is built by humans. We, can, we have to build it together. So. And this, is, uh, about, this presentation is about humans. Um, and so I, I figured there are some goals that I want to define um, in order to explain why um, this architecture is important. And the goals are uh, the following. First of all, discoverability, or in other words, uh, the way how you discover how your software works. For instance, if you join a new company or you just forget how things work because you work on a product for years, and this will happen, uh, you, you need a way to, to figure out how things are um, located, uh, even finding the, the right source of code for, for a feature that you see on a product is, uh, if it's not self-discoverable, it can become pretty hard. Uh, second goal is uh, work parallelization. Large software is not created by a single person, at least usually, and um, you want to be able to work in, in parallel with many people. Even, even, if, even if you work alone, Still, you want to be able to, you know, pause uh, one feature and start working on another feature and then come back without uh, then having to resolve uh, conflicts and rewrite everything. Uh, controlling shared abstractions. Um, in general, shared abstractions is anything that you share between multiple co consumers. And 
they are a huge source of bugs. And uh, we need to be aware that we have to uh, be cautious about using them and kind of learn to control them. Refactoring. Refactoring is kind of a bad word in the software engineering. Who of you has like a bad feeling about uh, when, you, when you have to talk about refactoring to your manager or someone? Raise your hands. <laughs> Quite a few. So it, it's not su supposed to be that way. It's, it just happened to be it because, because when we say we, we need to refactor, usually it means that we are going to be not working on any user-facing functionality for quite some time, and no one will know what we are doing and uh, when we are ready, and obviously managers don't like that. And it doesn't have to be that way. Um, A-B tests or um, experimenting. So basically, we need a way to experiment. If you work on a product, you need a way to, to build something that might be eventually wrong, and you want to be able to remove it quickly and uh, you know, don't, don't have remainings of it. Uh, if you are able to do this quickly, it's a good sign that your architecture is nice. Because, um, for instance, what you end up doing when you do refactoring, um, like when you do an A-B test, uh, you create usually many, many ifs. Like if this feature is enabled, then do this. And you spread these ifs all over the place. And then at some point it becomes so convoluted that you cannot really remove it or migrate completely to it. You will have some remainings in code. And what happens next is you go to a manager and ask for time for refactoring. And now, <laughs> now we are back in hell. So um, A-B tests is a kind of important benchmark for your architecture. And also integration tests. Um, I mean, unit tests is fine, but on a product code, unit tests are not very useful because they don't give you a uh, required amount of guarantee that your code it actually, actually works. Um, functional tests are important too, but they are expensive, they are slow, they are hard to make. So integration tests is kind of middle way uh, to do that, and I would prefer full coverage of integration tests than uh, any, uh, any unit tests. Uh, for the product, at least. For the library, it's a different story. So it's important that we can do it in a meaningful way and uh, e e in an easy way. Because if it's hard, we are not going to do it. Uh, so this talk is about feature-driven architecture, or this is how I called it, um, the best thing I could come up with. And what I mean by this is basically it's a set of principles that helps you to define the boundaries. Or in other words, set of principles that allows you to, to say how you split up your application in chunks. So you will ask yourself, is it for me? Like, who is this for? And I created a very complex uh, diagram that hel will help you with this decision. So if you're going to maintain the software for a longer period of time, when the size of this code will increase, then it's for you. And so, even if you are working alone in a dark room, drinking your cappuccinos, you should probably still uh, think about your future self. Because if you work on a product for half a year or more, you will definitely forget how it works or how you did it. Um, for instance, I, I ended up git blaming myself in the code base when I thought it cannot be me, but it was me. So, uh, think of your future self. And so these goals uh, led me to a bunch of principles uh, that I want to talk about, which is decentralization, explicit sharing, collocation, decoupling, and disposability. So how to avoid a death by a monolith? Uh, some people will disagree that a monolith is a bad thing, and it's not a bad thing for everyone. For certain size of application, it's kind of okay. -ish. But um, what is a monolith? Is it a monolith when the entire code base is in, is, in one mono, uh, is in one repo? I think it's not. To me, monolith is when the entire code base is interconnected, that everything depends on everything, and there is no strict rules. For instance, if you look at the default uh, Redux uh, structure, it's going to have components, containers, section creators, reducers, and so on. 
and uh, every single feature will be spread all over the place. Like for instance, in this case, our login is in containers and components and action creators. So it has no clear boundaries. A anything can, can potentially use anything. Uh, so my suggestion, what if, what if we use features as a thing to, 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 to split our application into chunks? Um, instead of types of code. For instance, component is a type, but a feature is something that is user-facing. So if we had a structure like this, features and then all the features, or any other structure that allows you to have, uh, you know, separation by features. Um, so what I, mean, what I mean by feature is actually kind of very complex question. You know, I, I cannot have a very exact definition of it because it will depend on your product. But in general, I came up with this. Feature is a self-contained, user-facing, reusable, complex building block. It's self-contained because it contains everything it needs. Uh, it's user-facing because we define our feature based on uh, user-facing functionality. It's reusable because it can be used on, on different pages or screens. And it's complex because it's a more high-level abstraction than a component. So our application can be basically split up into these categories. Uh, application has pages or screens. Pages or screens have features. Features have components. And components can use any utilities or libraries. So one important benefit is uh, navigating through your code by, by UI. Basically, if you, ha you know how a feature is called in the UI, you will find it uh, in, the, in, the, in the code base. Um, understanding this, the scope of impact means basically when we change something inside of a feature, we need to be sure that only this feature is affected. And I think everyone had this problem that you change something and completely unrelated feature breaks. And someone comes to you and says, why is it broken? You haven't been even working on it. Like, why that? Um, Common UI language is something you also need because you need to have a common terminology when you communicate to, to your coworkers, when you create issues and so on. And this structure will force you to use the same names without having too many synonyms. And also it gives you um, sort of private exports by convention because if we have a convention that only an index can be used for importing a, a feature, we can have modules which can export. So you don't have this problem when you export something from a module, it immediately becomes a public API. And anyone else can import from that uh, module and use it, and so you have unpredictable consequences for any change. So you kind of get modules uh, inside of the feature that you can uh, consider to be private and only index defines the public API. Another thing is, um, at some point, you will want to have shared code because you will want to, to have something that you can use in, in different features. But the benefit is that you will, you will be forced to be explicit about it. You will have to take this functionality and put it in some shared directory. And um, it will be obvious that this is used between many places. So sharing, sharing the code. There is... Uh, some untold truths about it. And the thing is, you can not trust even 100% unit test coverage. It can still break something if you change that code. And, you know, the reason is actually quite simple. Um, let's have a look at this example. Uh, this function uh, accepts an object. We do a type check, type of values in object. We spread this object, add a property, say hello, and we return uh, a value. So in the first case, it says uh, we pass, say hi, it gives us, say hello, and uh, some user of our code passes null, uh, happens, uh, and it still works, it says hi. Then at some point, we decided to, to, modify, uh, to modify this code. We added a property check, uh, so we access property, say, on a, on a value and check if it's a high. So in the first case, it will still say hello, but in the second case, it will be uncode type error. 
So the reason is, inside of our function, we did not anticipate a null. And usually if, you, if this function is part of a, of a li library, you are not going to anticipate every possible sort of usage of your function. So it's unpredictable. In this particular case, of course, you can use the static types, and you should. I actually recommend you to use static types, whatever you do, flow TypeScript. In, in case of flow, in this one, you don't even need to define the static types. Uh, it will find out this uh, problem and tell you. What about uh, more complex scenarios where static, static type checking will not discover the problem? For instance, this is the most simple example I could come up with. Uh, so we have a function. Uh, it has some code. Then it calls a callback that we pass into this function. Then it has some more code, and then it returns a value. Is it a pure function? Seems like that. It accepts the same value. It returns the same value. Se seems like a pure function. But what happens inside of uh, the function? Now imagine a user does some side effect in that, inside of that function. Uh, and some code that you have in that function relies on, on some, something that is global. And that side effect affects that state. So your function immediately becomes impure. So basically, you can consider that as soon as you accept any function, uh, your function is eventually impure. Even, even using some global functions can be already in, impure in JavaScript because it's a global environment that can be modified anytime. So the danger is always there. Uh, and that's, that's why um, shared, shared functionality is always dangerous. It, it can break any time. And um, you can never know. So what, what is important is that we, be, we are very cautious about uh, what do we share and how we do it. And we need some sort of decisions framework on how to decide when to share and when not to share. For instance, one good point is um, we need this code in at least two different places. Before that, it should be local. Uh, this code is non-trivial, otherwise it can be local and you can copy-paste it and, you know, it's fine. And um, last one is um, the frequency of change. If, if a feature changes very fre frequently and this code that you want to share changes as frequently as this feature, you should probably not put it into a shared code because um, as soon as you change it, you will potentially break some other feature that uses that code and it, it will be uh, lots of maintenance. So try to uh, share something that is stable. Also, um, a few advices when you share something, try to use pure functions as much as possible. Uh, write more tests for, for this explicitly shared functionality. Uh, design the interface more carefully. Do better code reviews on this code. And in general, just spend more time on this because shared functionality should be uh, taken care of. So third principle is collocation. And um, to me, collocation is basically a developer experience thing which helps you to navigate the code. So with the new Hooks uh, API, we, we added a better story for collocation inside of the co code. So for instance, on the left, we have this class-based component and um, uh, basically uh, the state and uh, the function that sets the state are kind of, kind of separated. It's, it looks pretty acceptable still here because the example is small and it will not look that way in a large component. On the other side, um, we can keep uh, a function that sets the state pretty close to, to, to the actual state and uh, related logic. So it's a code-related code collocation. What we can also do is um, file system-related uh, collocation. We can have a feature directory which contains, uh, when we talk about Redux, all the uh, things Redux has, like containers, section creators, section types, renderers, and so on. So we put them, instead of, instead, instead of putting them all globally, we put them inside of the feature. And also we can put everything else. We can put CSS images, tests, 
uh, literally anything, and it will make for a much better discovery story. And um, another point is um, decoupling. Uh, decoupling and isolation. Uh, I, I think of it uh, more of like a common case scenario, but um, it's not that obvious for software. For instance, if you build a car, it's kind of obvious that you don't build a, build a steering wheel uh, that has an integrated speakers. Or do you? I, I mean, I don't know, but I wouldn't. <laughs> because, I mean, at some point you will want to have another car that uses the same steering wheel but another speaker, right? So it's kind of common sense in that case, but it's not for software. So we need some principles that, or rules that allow us to, to make these decisions more easily. And uh, I have a few of them. So a feature should not depend on other features because you want to be able to remove that feature without touching anything else. A page or a screen should not depend on other pages or screens. Same story. And a shared abstraction should not depend on either of them because shared abstraction is, can be used in a page or in a feature. So don't break these rules because if you break these rules, um, you can forget your entire architecture because there will be no architecture. So let's have a look at this example. Uh, we, have a, we have two features. We have a header and a login. And uh, we have a page that renders um, header and login form. Um, so now we want to add a login logout button in the header. You know that button that shows login when you, uh, when you are not logged in and shows logout when you are logged in. So in order to do that, we lift the state to the page. Um, we use uh, a state property that is called locked out, uh, that it has a default value of locked out, and it has um, a login status, and it has a function set login status, and we have um, two actions on login and on logout. Right? We pass, we pass this all to a header because header renders the uh, login button, and we pass uh, what we need to login form. So what's the problem with this? This is the implementation of this potential header. It has login status on login, on logout. It renders the button. It uses uh, the login status. It loses uh, on login, on logout actions. So there are a few problems with that. It's completely coupled. So here is completely coupled with login. You are unlikely be able to refactor your login uh, without touching the header. So here knows about login status and its potential values. Here knows about login and logout actions. And um, here knows uh, how to render and to style the button. In React, we have uh, many, many ways um, to decouple our logic. Uh, we can use render prop, and we can use element as a prop, and we can use a component as a prop. So let's use a an element as a prop. I mean, everyone knows uh, render prop, but rarely people use component as a prop or element, so that use, uh, let's use this one. So this is a new header. It just renders an element that is a login logout button. It doesn't know anything else about it. So this is our page now. We render the header and we pass this login logout button and we render, so we create an element from login logout button component here and basically the header receives the element. So how does the login logout button know now what state it has and what actions uh, it can call? So obviously we, we miss something here. And so what we can do, and we can use uh, um, a context. And the new React context API is kind of nice. It's uh, encapsulated. So we can use, uh, we can create um, a login uh, context and we can create a login provider that um, basically uh, creates uh, the status uh, on login, on logout actions and uh, passes them uh, um, to, as a context. When uh, we implement the login logout button, we can consume the same context. We receive the status and on login, on logout actions. And we can render the logout button when we are not locked, uh, when we are locked in and login button when we are locked out. So. It's nice. 
now what we, ha we ha what we have to do is now we have to use a login provider and make sure that header and login form is rendered inside of it because both of them will need to access uh, this context. And this was uh, a quite encapsulated story. We uh, completely decoupled our header from login functionality and still we are able to render a login inside of the header. So the same thing can be done with 3DX, with, with the 3DX that we have right now out there. Uh, for instance, Redux wants us to have one global state, but it doesn't mean that everything needs to, needs to be interconnected. For instance, we can scope action types just by convention. In this case, I use uh, this convention that is uh, feature, then feature name, and then the, uh, the action type. We can scope action creators, and it's actually quite easy. Uh, the only convention that we follow is we connect every feature. And so when we connect a feature, we pass the mapping between the action creators. And so action creators can be used only inside of this feature. They are encapsulated. And the most important thing is the state. If you can access anything inside of the global state from any feature, you have no idea what, what's going to happen if you change something because anything can impact anything. And in this case, we have sort of scoped state because we have a global state object, then we have features, and then we have specific features, uh, substates, uh, like in this case, error, profile, and repo are features. And what's inside of them is a feature scoped state, which we are not allowed to touch uh, uh, from outside, just by convention. So let's talk about disposability. It's uh, might sound like a bold statement, but I think, uh, I mean, I still do try to predict the future and optimize for something that I have no idea about, but eventually it fails almost always. Because when you build your code in a way and try to think about how it will be modified, what changes need to be done in the future, you kind of playing this future predictor and we did not learn how to predict the future or I don't know, at least I didn't. And usually we fail in this. What we can do instead is uh, we can optimize for ease of removal because this is what you can do based on what you already know. For instance, you know that at some point everything is going to be a mess. We know that. So what we can do is we can optimize for ease of removal so that we can remove something and rewrite it. Because if you can remove something easily, you can rewrite it more easily. And this is something we can do based on the knowledge that we already have. So the only question will be then, um, if you follow this or not, if, if you don't follow this, you will basically have to refactor every, everything because you will have to touch code spread all, all the place uh, versus you refactor just one isolated feature, which is a nice uh, goal to have. So these six um, um, goals led me to these five um, principles that I kind of discovered for myself, but they are probably described in all the smart books uh, about architecture, like Solid. And um, these are decentralization, explicit sharing, collocation, isolation, and disposability. That's it from me. Um, I've created this um, uh, repository where I have a Redux example that implements this architecture. You can run it. Uh, you can also try it online. And also, I would like to start uh, a discussion uh, in the issues uh, about how we, we can make it more formal kind of specification for, for this architecture. So I in case you're interested, hit me up. Thanks for having me.